Hey, I got a couple of things, but y'all might not know who I am. I'm John. Hi. Hi. Oh, uh, man, it's good to be back with my Momentum family. Uh, for those of you that haven't met me, my name is John Tizovich. I'm a friend of Momentum. I'm hanging out with you guys for the last few months now. It feels, uh, man, it's longer than that, but uh, just preaching and helping and doing whatever I can here, and I'm just glad to be here on the Sunday before Christmas, right? Christmas Eve services are coming up. Hey, uh, just real quick, don't forget, uh, I know you know when Christmas Eve is, right? Okay, hopefully you do. It's Tuesday. We have two services at 5 and 6.30. We're all coming together at the Twinsburg Macedonia campus. So make sure that you are there, but also that you use these invite cards. They are on your chairs, and you give them to someone. I'll talk more about that later in the service, but you use these, and you invite somebody to church. Those of you tuning in online, why aren't you here? I mean, unless you're in like Columbus or Indiana or Honolulu. Uh, hi, invite me next time. You know, like you get, get here. Get here on Tuesday, all right? For those of you online, hi. Hey. I'm actually uh, much less loud and energetic uh, in person than I am on your screen, so sorry. Hey, um, really. Like, it, it's a big deal for me to be here the Sunday before Christmas because this is like the, the launch pad, you know, as, as we go to Christmas Eve services, and, and I'm just glad to be here. We're finishing up a series um, called Two Sides of a King, all right? Um, Two Sides of a King, where we're talking about this idea that Jesus is fully God and he's fully human, all right? Today, I'm going to wrap it up with Jesus being fully God and what that means for our lives today because we don't want to just gather together on a Sunday here's some noise here's some stuff that doesn't actually apply to our lives we want to actually take some information let it, it let it seep in let it actually get into our heart make some changes and then change the world around us right yeah. Yeah. don't give me come on if I say ask you a question you have to give me energy back right there it is. Okay, now we're ready. I don't have any sexy intro. We're going straight into Matthew 1, okay? Nothing, all right? We're going Matthew 1. We're starting at verse 18, so get ready. For those of you who have gone to church for a while, you know this story. I'm talking about the birth of Jesus. For those of you who don't know this story, you haven't read this story in the Bible, it's okay. I'm glad you're here, but just know that this story is weird, okay? Just know that. Here's what I mean. Our text for today, Matthew 18, sorry, Matthew 1, verse 18. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph. Cool. But before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. What? <laughs> that's normal, I guess. You guys reacted like, oh, yeah, that's, that happens all the time. My cousin Judy, the same thing happened to her. She had to get a shot. It was fine. Like, <laughs> That's not weird? Found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. Okay, we'll keep going. But Joseph, her husband, was faithful to the law. All right, that means he was righteous. He lived according to the law. And yet he did not want to expose her to public disgrace. He had in mind to divorce her quietly. See, what had happened was. All right, but after he had considered this, he took a time out. An angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream. And said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary home as your wife, because what is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. <laughs> okay. She will give birth to a son, and you are to give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. I love, because I can be funny and all that stuff, and that's great. Or I try, attempt to be funny. Let's make that clear. Um, I love, though, in all seriousness, that it says Jesus, he claims us right off the bat. He will save his people. Man, I could end it right there and drop the mic and walk away. He claims us as his. And somebody needs to hear that, that you keep this negative self-talk running through your mind of like, I'm garbage, I'm crap, I'm all this stuff. Nobody could ever love me. I'm, I'm never going to, that noise. God doesn't make crap. He makes masterpieces and he claims us. We're his people. The Lord of Lords, we're his people. Ha ha, keep going. Because he will save his people from their sins. That's not my sermon today. So all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet, the prophet Isaiah. 
All this took place. All this, all that crazy baby drama that we were just talking about, all that leading up to it, all this took place. And I wonder if there's anybody sitting here today or, or online watching that you're going through all this. Three days out from Christmas, you're going through all this. I mean, let's keep it real. There's some of y'all that well, we're going through some tough times right now. All this stuff, not knowing when things are going to get right. We're, we're, we're trying to look for the light at the end of the tunnel, trying to climb out of debt, trying to break the chains of addiction, trying to find peace, trying to find hope, trying to make sense of the mess that we currently find ourselves in. And I just want to speak this over your life because I know this is for somebody because as I was typing this up, I'm like typing and it hit me like, ooh, ooh, I didn't write that. That, that Holy Ghost like moment when you're writing a sermon, if you ever do that, there's these moments where you're like, Ooh, uh, that's not, um, what? It's the weirdest thing in the world. Talk to a pastor about it. It's the weirdest moment. This is for somebody right here. You need to hear this. All that you're walking through, all that is taking place, the parts that you like that, that, that you're walking through right now, the parts that you don't like, the parts that hurt, the part that are confusing, the parts that suck, the parts that don't, all of it is taking place for you to draw closer to God's purpose for your life. All of it. Romans 8, 28 says, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. All of it. He's working it all out for the good. Just keep going. If we look back at verse 22 in Matthew, Joseph is in one of those spots, man. He's in a tough spot. Now, he's got all sorts of doubts. At least he should. Humanly speaking. He's got fears. How'd my fiance get knocked up by some dude named the Holy Spirit? That's a weird name. Sounds Irish. Just had to pick a, you know, I don't know. But like, it's a mess, right? It's very messy. This guy, like the stress is really high. And he's desperate. And you know, isn't it just like God to drop down hope right in the middle of desperation? Isn't that like who he is? At least how I understand and read the Bible. Like right when Joseph needed it, God drops peace and purpose in the middle of problems. Whew. That's a preacher thing, like alliteration. Peace, purpose, problems. That's true. He will drop peace and purpose in the midst of your problems. And somebody needs to hear that in this season right now, in the chaos of life that you're walking through, it's when we get desperate, when we get desperate, when we actually get to that point where we drop to our knees, when we raise our hands and surrender, when we come to the end of our rope and we cry out, help, that is when the rescuer shows up. That point when you get to the place, I'm thinking about quitting. I'm thinking about walking out. I'm thinking about just ending it all. I can't do this. It's that point that God steps in and says, I got you. I got you. Verse 23, 22. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet Isaiah. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did what the angel of the Lord had commanded him and took Mary home as his wife, but he did not consummate their marriage until she gave birth to a son, and he gave him the name Jesus. Let me pray. Jesus, just guide me during our time together right now. Help me to just get out of the way and for your word to prevail, I ask that, uh, that your presence will be felt, that um, you'll plant seeds of hope and life change and life transformation uh, during our time together today, that everyone under the sound of my voice um, will somehow encounter you in strange ways, in new ways, in, in life-changing ways, Jesus. We're asking for life change. Jesus, um, if there's anything that I say today that is not of you or from you, help people forget it immediately. <laughs> but let us all take steps forward to be more of the men, women, and students that you created us to be because of what you do 
and what you are doing through us and in us. We love you, Jesus. It's in your name that all God's people say, amen. Amen. The miracle in the mess. Turn to somebody and say, you're a mess. Yeah, you are. Some of y'all been waiting the last six weeks to say that. The pastor said it so I can say it to you. You're a mess. How come you never do the laundry? You're a mess. The miracle in the mess. It is three days till Christmas, y'all. You hype? (laughs) You know that was the fakest yell scream because there was a beat right before you did it. Right? And that, that, that you just got to know timing and everything. I said, are you hype? And all y'all went, uh-uh. And then you did. Right? Some of y'all were like, uh-uh. Mm-mm. Who's stressed? Anybody? Yeah, thank you for your honesty. Thank you for that. Who's excited? Yeah. Yeah. Now, I can tell who has kids. Just FYI. That right? Just, just by your answers. Who is really hoping that I make this real quick and the preacher man uh, finishes his sermon really quick so I can get out there and get all my stuff done, right? Because we have that nonstop to-do list before Wednesday comes, right? Right. It's the most wonderful time of the year when the traffic is horrible and what normally takes 10 minutes now takes an hour. I want to just die. It's the most wonderful time. You know, because it's, it, you know, we're, we're Cleveland, you know, Cleveland through and through. Like, y'all see that LeBron commercial about the cranberry Sprite? Yeah. You know what I mean? It's just, it's a little creepy, all right? And maybe it's just me because I'm, like, you know, messed up. I'm completely transparent about that. But, like, he's like, it's the thirst, thirstiest time. But there's another meaning for thirsty that some of y'all know, right? Some of y'all know. Some that don't, well, you know, ask a young person. Like, I'm like, dang, you're just going to put it out there like that? It's the thirstiest time of the year? Whoa! Okay, Bron. Okay. But there's some truth to that, right? We get thirsty at Christmas time. Mm, let's be honest. Let's be honest. Thirsty for all sorts of things and people and stuff. Mm, there's some things. As we go into Christmas time, if we're being really honest, there's stress, and we start looking sideways to things that maybe we think will help us, but really not they're going to help us. There's going to be an added distraction to the distraction to the mess that we're really feeling, that's the mess that's underneath the mess, because we don't wanna, really want to deal with the mess, so we're just a little thirsty for a distraction. It's the most wonderful time going into financial debt because I don't want Wednesday to come and there not be enough tree and enough presents underneath the tree. So I'm just going to go buy a little more, a little more, wrap a little more, put a little more under there so I feel, you know, don't feel like a horrible parent, you know, but really, you know, you know, gifts don't actually buy love and all that stuff, but we don't really get that. And so, you know, like, you know, and so we ended up like buying more stuff, you know, that we don't really need to impress people that we don't really like. Except for your kids. I, okay, except for the kids. We love them. Uh, but you know what I mean? Like, dang, man, you don't really need to spend that on that person just so they like you, but you don't really like them, but you just want their acceptance. But we spend money and go into debt because of it. Like, yeah, that money that we don't have for stuff we don't need. You know, maybe it's just me. Okay, uh, maybe it's just me, and I'm the only one who, who doesn't get it right every single time. <laughs> By the law of averages tells me that that's not the case. That in this room, there is a whole lot of mess. Right? Now, add to that, I'm just going to be really honest, and the guy in the camera, I'm so sorry. Um, My family, does anybody else have, like, Christmas family gathering drama issue stuff? You know, there's, like, there's, like, there's certain family members that, like, please don't be there. Is that, like... I know I'm a pastor and I'm not supposed to say it, but, you know, I'm just keeping it real. I'm honest. I promise to always be honest with you. Like, you know, God help me in that. Like, there's some family members that maybe you are like, please don't be at this Christmas dinner. Please get a flat tire and get stuck somewhere. It, it's supposed to be nice weather this week, so it's not like they're stuck in the freezing cold. Come on. you know. Just, please, Jesus, hear my prayer. My family at best can be compared to like the, the, the Griswold family, right? 
at best. And, and the Christmas party that you see in that movie, that's our Christmas dinner, right? Like just the mess and the different people, personalities, and the weird what's in the box. It's a cat. I don't know. I, I don't know. Like what's in, the, what's in the box, Brad Pitt, if anybody saw that movie? What's in the box? Like that, yeah, I'm not rap opening the present, right? You just realize that I jumped all sorts of movies just there. Wow. Like, I got, I won't name their names because if they happen to tune in online, I don't want them to hear. But I got this one that, like, it's Eddie to a T, right? Like, they'll literally walk out of the bathroom and be like, hey, John, your crapper's full. Like, what do you want me to do about it now, man? Every year, every year, it doesn't change. That's fine. And maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. But end of year, you had the family, the financial, the stress. Then you add this idea that we're supposed to finish well by the end of the year, right? That we're, that we're supposed to, like, finish strong and wrap everything up neatly with a bow so we can have a clean slate going into 2020, right? Right? And so then by doing that and this idea that we're supposed to do that, it's, it's adding this, this pressure on us. And then there's, we set these unrealistic expectations as, as people, as parents, as spouses, as friends. And, and it just all adds to feeling like, oh, where is the Christmas? Can we just get through the holidays? Because the one thing that the holidays do, it's like they put a magnifying glass on the mess that's in us and the mess that we're dealing with, right? I needed a moment. <laughs> what, what is that, Snickers? Need a moment? Or is that Kit Kat? Need a, what, I forget. The one. It's a Kit Kat. Need a break? Yeah. I needed a moment. I, I'm walking through it, y'all. Just being transparent, you know, and I'm not trying to like, oh, woe is me and all that stuff because we all got stuff, right? But I... I, I want to lead in transparency. Like, sometimes we get this idea that, ooh, the more you walk in life, and definitely with a pastor, like, oh, then your life is totally cool, and you got it all figured out. <laughs> no. Okay? Quite the opposite. You just learn who to give that stuff over to. But I'm in it. I'm in it. Dealing with stuff. that I, I, Man, like, my son is dealing with stuff at 11 years old that he should not be dealing dealing with right now and I don't know how to navigate them well I, I don't like as a parent it's those moments where I just feel helpless but I don't know how to help you buddy other than to love you and let you know that I will always be there for you that doesn't take away the pain of the moment I got the call yesterday John we need you to do a funeral your aunt died you, you know then that moment when you're like you got to step into the, I got to wear both hats, family and pastor, and navigate my grief process and my, just the stuff. Man, it, it stinks. You know, like, okay, hey, let's get the family together and, and do prep for the service. W when you want to do that, Christmas Eve or Christmas? Okay. All right, when's the funeral? Day after Christmas. Okay. Okay. All right, cool. It's cool. It's all okay. It's stuff. We got stuff. You know, I wouldn't be joking about the stuff underneath the Christmas tree and the financial stress that comes with that if I haven't walked through that. I'll never talk about things that I, 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 I'm not first going to be exposed to or have dealt with. Not because I read it in a book, because I've experienced it. And then add to all that, like, it's just the, the, this time of year, like, you know when you add on too much and you know you've added on too much, but there's nothing you can do about it right now, you just, like, plow through? Yeah, that's where I'm at. <laughs> You know, I do this show every year at, the, at my job. I work at a theater, and we do this show called A Christmas Carol every year, 38 years. 38 years we've been doing it, all right? And we draw thousands of people from all over Ohio and out of state. We come in, and they see this show, and it's awesome. It's great. Um, but this year, the guy who plays Bob Cratchit ended up not being able to play Bob Cratchit right at the last minute. And so I'm looking, staring down the end of the, like, oh, how are we going to get to there? So I end up in the show, and I'm like, yeah, this is what I need, 5,000 performances in the midst of everything else. Sure, great. Our last show is today at 2 o'clock. Hey, hey, yeah, I'm so excited. I'm really happy because my kids are in it, and I'm playing Bob Cratchit, and I, I get to play with my, my, my kids. You know, they're the Cratchit kids, and so it's kind of fun and all that stuff. But y'all, man, I'm tired. And I'm just like, Jesus, help. Help. And I, I feel like that's a lot of times where we need to get to. For Jesus and to break through in real tangible ways in our lives. 
In the, in the story of A Christmas Carol, for those of you who don't know it, um, you've been living under a rock. Uh, so uh, it was written in 1843 um, and, uh, by Charles Dickens, and uh, it's this story that many of you have probably seen on TV at this time of year or read the book, maybe or read in school. Uh, the first version, the movie version of A Christmas Carol that I saw was this one, George C. Scott, Christmas Carol, that one. I'm ready to see that one before. Yeah, big bushy mutton chops there. That's awesome. Um, the, the, my, that's my dad's favorite Christmas Carol. Uh, my kid's favorite Christmas Carol is the one with Jim Carrey, this one that came out several years ago, right? That's fun. You've never seen that one? You got to check it out. It's real fun. Uh, my favorite is with Bill Murray. I see you! I see you! Yes! This is the real Christmas Carol, because that's my type of humor right there, appropriate completely. Like, the, the story of a Christmas Carol, for the, for the one person that maybe you haven't seen any of these movies and all that stuff, is a man named Ebenezer Scrooge who has become bitter, and his life, is, his heart has been hardened because of life events, and, and he only cares about himself, right? Well, Ebenezer Scrooge ends up being haunted by three ghosts, the past, present, and the future, and they take him on this journey of life, looking at his life and showing him the error of his ways, you know, to give him this second chance on life, not just so that he can be a better man, but so that he can live a better life and change the world around him. In the midst of doing this show and in the midst of sermon prep, these two worlds and ideas collided of the lengths that God would go to to step into the mess of our lives to make us better so that we can make the world better, right? When I look back at verse 23, when he was talking about the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. This idea that God is with us, that he will break through. Like I'm a simple guy. Like I, I grew up on meat and potatoes. Like that's it. That's that's we're Russian, and that's just like it. Meat and potatoes. No, I had nothing to do with the Facebook controversy. Okay, like 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 you're like some of y'all missed it. It's political stuff. It's fine. I shouldn't bring it up here. Like like it's just I'm simple, and I can't grasp this idea that the God who hung the planets in the sky, the God who 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 knows like. Every single one of your desires of your heart who knows the number of hairs on your head, not mine. Like the God who, who put mountains there, who paints the sky every day, every morning and every sunset. That that God would step down from his throne as the king of king, lord of lords, and step into the stank of a cave surrounded by animal feces to be born a baby with the sole purpose of dying a horrific death. Where do you place that, right? All, to do all of that, to redeem and restore the broken relationship between us and humanity, to once and for all show us how much we are truly loved. King of kings, Lord of lords, I love how the Apostle John writes it. This is the message version of John 1.14. It says this, the word Jesus became flesh and blood and he moved into the neighborhood. I mean, that's awesome, right? The king moved next door. There are some people when they move next door, we're like, nah, there goes the neighborhood. <laughs> right? I'm moving. Time to sell. The Lord of Lords moves next door and says, I, I want to be as close as I can to you. I'm moving in. Right? In the beginning of the book of Matthew, like, I, we, we didn't talk about it because it's boring. Um, <laughs> I mean, Matthew 1.1 1, 1 is a snooze fest. If you're not really just trying to, like, dig into the Bible and you, like, you geek out over the Bible, you know, and study it, and that's fine, and we should. Like, but on Sunday morning, like, let's not walk through the genealogy of Jesus. Okay, Sunday morning is hard enough to stay awake. Some of you are struggling right now. It's fine, right? You're like, wrap it up. Time to go. Time to get shopping. Yeah, uh-huh. Like, but there's, there's something really important that we need to capture in Matthew 1.1 1, 1 that I'm just going to share with you and not walk through it. It's this list of names in the beginning of Matthew that represents not only Jesus' family lineage to the king of David and Abraham, and it's, let, it's laying out, you know, all these the prophecies that are being fulfilled through the birth of Jesus. It also represents 40 generations 
of people that have been waiting for a Messiah. People waiting for someone to restore the nation of Israel, waiting for this relationship with God to be restored and redeemed. And when we finally get to the birth of Jesus, it's been more than 400 years of silence. 400 years of God not talking. The most epic silent treatment ever, right? Because throughout the story of the Bible, we read how God's people, you know, you know, they couldn't live up to the laws and standards that God had put in place. And so we read about how his people, like, they, they fell away, they are displaced, they're discouraged, they've been hunted, they're haunted. Like, God's people are desperate, desperate for a king, desperate for deliverance, desperate for, to be restored, desperate for breakthrough, desperate for a miracle, and 400 years of nothing. And then God steps in. It's just the right moment, and he breaks this silence to bring about redemption and restoration to an entire nation. And how does he do it? With a baby. Y'all, listen, if you're going to, like, overthrow a government, (laughs) transform a world, is that really, that's your rescue plan? A baby? Like, with the seven pound, seven ounce bundle of poop, you know, like, that's your rescue plan? A baby? Really? That. (laughs) Okay, I'm out. (laughs) But think about it. What are babies, aside from cute and adorable and smelly and stinky? Small? Insignificant? Unexpected? isn't that just like Jesus though greatest will be least you want to you want to do great things get small unexpected and so intentional everything about this is intentional Jesus stepping right into the mess of this situation is so intentional and it's messy literally right stepping into the mess where was Jesus born Away in a manger, sleeping in the hay, right? All that stuff, right, that we just talked about, yeah? That's fancy words for, like, he was in a feeding trough, right? A feeding trough, you know, no room at the inn, at the Holiday Inn, right? Like, he was born in a cave, what, with a, surrounded by farm animals and excrement. You don't know what excrement is? Ask a neighbor. Like, the, that's the mess, right? Shepherds standing in the mess. Donkeys making a mess. It's all there. Mary's a mess, right? Teen moms, sign her up right now, right? Unwed, pregnant, teenage mom. From the outside, looks like she's had an affair and she's been unfaithful to, fi- to her fiancé, which in that day meant that she was like, like they could totally like accuse her and have her stoned to death. Joseph's a mess. Fiance sleeping around with the dude, you know, whole spirit. And scripture says that right, Joseph is a righteous man, you know, which he has the reputation of living up to the, according to God's law and the standard. And now he's about to lose all of that and be disgraced because of this premarital situation. It's messy. It's dark. It's cold. And it's all on purpose. The greatest gift ever given is given right in the midst of the mess. Right in the middle of the mess, we will find the miracle. And that's good news. That's not just good news for way, way back when. That is good news right now for your mess. Don't shy away from your mess that you have right now. Because we've all got a mess. If we could go around the room and one by one say, what's your mess? No, the mess that's under the mess. What's your mess? It'd be the most awkward church service ever, right? Nope, 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 not today. Nope. So much no. Every single one of us got real messes that we try to tuck and bury, put in the closet. We'll deal with that later. Nope, not going to talk about it. Nope. And the more we do that, the more that we bury the mess, it will resurrect. It will come back. And it will be uglier and messier than it was when it first started. The reality is to face the mess head on. The miracle is in the mess. I need to hear that. 
I need to stop shying away from it or, 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 or acting like it's not there and lean into it and meet Jesus right in the mess. He's already there. He's already waiting. Will you meet him in your mess? Or will you keep trying to white knuckle it and do it on your own? Like, we talk about Christmas Eve services, and, 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 that, and that's awesome. But, like, for some of us, you know, if we're being honest, like, we can be like, oh, man, that's hard to do. Invite somebody to church. Like, okay, really? You invite somebody to do everything else except go to church. Why is that? If you're feeling convicted, it's not me. That's Holy Spirit stuff. Like, wh- why? If we believe what we believe, that he is truly the hope of all nations, and he holds all the things that we need to truly live the best life possible, why would we keep that from people? You know, I get it. it can get messy to have that conversation. Like, hey, I noticed that, you know, you're a sinner, and, um, you know, you need Jesus. You know, like, hey, don't do that. <laughs> That's awkward. But, but the reality is that this time of year and Easter are the two times of year that people are most receptive to having that Jesus conversation, to having that, yeah, I'll, I'll go to church. Yeah, I, I actually, I don't know, it's just one of those things I feel like I'm supposed to do right now. And Yeah, sure. It's not like they're going to one day wake up on the 24th and be like, you know what, I'm going to go to Momentum. I haven't gone to church in 20 years. I'm going to go there. You are the conduit. You. You, for your neighbor, for your coworker, for your friend, for your neighbor, you are the one who God wants to use to bring somebody into their miracle. Like, what's stopping you? You know, like, because it's messy? Okay, so <laughs> that's where Jesus does his best work. Who are you supposed to ask? Really, who are, you, who are you supposed to ask to, to bring in? Twinsburg Macedonia campus should not be able to handle what y'all bring on Tuesday. Right? Should not. It's Christmas Eve, baby. It's Christmas Eve. She said, what's Tuesday? <laughs> it's okay. Should not be able to handle it. Should be at capacity, overflow in the little welcome lobby area. Should be at capacity. If one person, every single one of us said, you're coming with me, kicking and screaming, I don't care. Jesus is going to show up. He wants to see you. And yeah, that, that can get messy, but I, I, I want to ask you to invite Jesus into the real mess that you're wrestling through. The real one. The one that you want to shy away from. And so here's what I want you to do. Uh, I want you to, in your moments, because you already have your phone out, being distracted, wondering what time it is, is to, on your phone, to make a note and just say, Jesus, will you meet me in this? Whatever it is. Jesus, will you meet me in my financial mess? Will you meet me in my marriage because I'm about to walk out? Will you meet me right where I am because I'm about to give up? Will you meet me? Start there. Put it in text. Let yourself see the words to own it, to name it. Will you do that? It's the first step. Second thing I want to ask you to do is ask, is ask for those of you that know Jesus, who, who, who put him as leader in your life, will you say, Jesus, where do you want me to show up? Because I represent you. So where do you want me to show up? What mess do you want me to show up in? What relationship, what situation do you want me to show up in? Because he's asking you to be a part of the redemption plan. It's not just a one and done thing. He's asking you to be a part of the plan. Will you play your part type of thing? I mentioned Christmas Carol, and I'm doing that. And at the heart of a Christmas Carol is this challenge to mankind, to all of us, to be better. To be better, to love better, to, 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 to do better, to care for those who can't care for themselves. That, that if we have the means to do so, it's not an option, it's an obligation. It is our duty. There's this moment where this character, the ghost of Christmas present, you know, he's showing Scrooge his life, the life that he doesn't see because he's so focused on self. And he shows him this Cratchit family 
this family of, the, of his clerk, Bob Cratchit, that is suffering, that, it, that does not have you know, the means to meet their needs, and his son is dying, and, and it, the family is, is just at their wit's end. And the ghost says to Scrooge, like, I can give this family a feast today, but where will the next one come from? Today is my last day on this earth. Who will take responsibility tomorrow? Isn't that the story of the Christian life? That Jesus is saying the same thing to us? Like, who will take responsibility? You are my people. I gave you my son. I sent the Holy Spirit. He's in you for those who have accepted. Like, will you take responsibility? To look at the mess around you, the relationships, the situations, to represent me of hope and light? In the final scene of A Christmas Carol, when Scrooge has his awakening finally, you know, he, he visits the Cratchit family in real time, in, re, in real life. And he goes to their decrepit house, and Scrooge steps into this moment. He steps into their mess, and he tells Cratchit that every day from this day forward will be like Christmas. Every day, not just Christmas Day. And he says that he went on to be better than his word, that he held Christmas in his heart better than any man. For me, that's the picture of the Christian life, that every day we, we step right into the mess. We meet Jesus right there, because that's what he does, right? Right? That's why he came, right? Like, not to condemn, not to rub our nose in it. Look at the mess you made. But he came to heal, to transform, to restore, to, to, to rescue the brokenhearted, to break the chains of the enslaved, of the captive. What Jesus did for me, I'm supposed to do for my neighbor. Where there's despair, I, I represent hope. Where there's need, we offer help. Where there's hate, we offer love. Where, where there's a mess, we step in and we make way for a miracle. A pastor told me a long time ago, and it always stuck with me, he was a mentor, he said, we are blessed for one reason and one reason alone, and that is to be a blessing. That's the point that Scrooge missed. The reason why we are blessed is to be a blessing, to make the world better, to, to make it a place that looks more like heaven, to bring heaven to earth. So if we are blessed to be a blessing, then I will leave you with the words of Tiny Tim. May God bless us everyone, so that we may be a blessing.